Hello, everyone, and welcome to New Consciousness Review. I'm Miriam Knight, and our guest today is Emmanuel Von Lee. He's a director, producer, musician, and composer, and he's directed and produced numerous award-winning films, including Yukon Kings, in coming out in 2013, Thousand Sons, What Would It Look Like, A Game for Life, and Barrio de Paz. And his film that we're going to discuss today is called Elemental. It's his first feature-length documentary about three very impressive eco-warriors. Emmanuel is also the founder and executive director of the Global Oneness Project, a Webby Award-winning online magazine. Now, prior to his work in film, Emmanuel performed and recorded as a sideman with some of the biggest names in jazz, and he's also released two critically acclaimed records under his own name, Previous Misconceptions in 2002 and Borrowed Time in 2005. And I might add that all these accomplishments have been crammed into just 33 years. (laughs) Welcome, Emmanuel. Thanks for that (laughs) embarrassingly long bio. (laughs) Well, I want our readers to know what they're dealing with. You know, we have this kind of wave of 30-somethings who really look set to change the world. So I am really pleased to have you with us today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, get to chat with you today. You were fully launched as a successful jazz musician, so what inspired you to make films? Um, I I started playing music at a young age, first playing cello at seven, um, and then transitioning transitioning to bass when I was around 11 years old. Uh, And then when I was 13, someone gave me a Miles Davis record, and I was bitten by the jazz bug and ended up dropping out of high school and pursuing a jazz career and started playing professionally when I was 15. Wow. Um, and that was my life um, for the next 10 years. Um, I studied at Berkeley College of Music, uh, composition, performance, all the usual suspects you know, that you would pursue um, if music is your love. And, uh, and after, after university, I was, I was touring and playing a lot, 300 plus nights a year. And at a certain point, I started to get a little burned out, and um, which I think a lot of artists go through. You know, you're doing what you love, but it's also can be challenging just to keep that enthusiasm and creativity alive with um, the schedule of of playing that much. And just as I was at kind of at a, you know, a point where I was a bit tired and a bit fed up with some of the some of the gigs that I had at that at that particular time, I think it was back in 2004, 2005. Um, somebody gave me an opportunity to say, well, you would like to come work on this film. And it was kind of out of the blue, something I had never thought of working on. But I was just at that right moment where I was kind of like, well, I, you know, a little bit, a little bit depressed, I guess, in some ways about, about how my music career was going as far as, um, being able to do certain creative things. And, um, I said, you know what, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try film. Why not? I'm, just, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm not giving up my music career, but this sounds exciting. And I jumped right into it. And I didn't think I would abandon my musical career, but within a year, my musical career kind of started to fall by the wayside. And I wasn't taking uh, offers for jobs anymore and playing as many gigs. And I was just exploring, I guess, film with the same enthusiasm that I had explored jazz as, as a young musician. And uh, within a couple of years, you know, music was really not, not, not really part of how I was making a living anymore. And I was devoting myself fully to making films. Now, if I understand correctly, this film um, featured your father, Llewellyn Von Lee, who was a Sufi lecturer and author. Um, what was your spiritual worldview growing up? Um, yeah, my, my father is, I guess, less of a, a lecturer, more he's an author and a, and, a, and a Sufi teacher. He does lecture a bit, but um, he's more of just a, a kind of traditional Sufi teacher and, and writes many books. Uh, I grew up, uh, I guess, in a very unique environment, in, you know, kind of a, in an ashram, I guess you could describe it, in North London. Um, my parents owned a house, and their teacher... Um, lived downstairs uh, in the house that we owned, and my mother looked after her. She was a, a woman in her 80s, a Russian woman who had traveled to India in the 1960s and been trained by a Sufi master, who then asked her to bring this particular lineage of Sufism to the West, which was a very bizarre thing to happen in India at the time, A, to pass along tradition to a woman, and, and, uh, and a Western woman at that. 
um, and she came to the to 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 the UK and taught there. And my father was one of her uh, students, who then took over from her when she became too old to teach and brought the Tish tradition to America. So I grew up in a house um, filled with people who were coming uh, to to learn about uh, Sufism and about mysticism and about uh, God and about spiritual life. So I think one of the first words, I, me and my sister always joke, is one of the first words we heard growing up was, shh, you got to be quiet, they're meditating. <laughs> because every day downstairs in the flat below where we lived, 80 to 100 people would come for satsang and be meditating. So I was around that world from a young age. And of course, the values of Sufism and, and a mystical tradition seeped into how we were raised in every respect. Um, for us, it was normal to spend a couple hours a day meditating. Even when we were kids, I meditated when I was five or six. I started meditating seriously, and I didn't think it was strange until I was sharing it with my friends at school a couple years later when they were asking what meditation was and why you'd want to sit still. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's just very much who I am and everything I've done in my life, whether it be music or now film or any kind of media, I think stems from that background that I had, which was based in uh, a mystical tradition and is based in a mystical tradition. How fascinating. And you are one of the uh, founders of the, uh, the Oneness Project, the Global Oneness Project. So I assume that that also stems from this tradition. Well, we, well, definitely. I mean, I think, as I said, anything that I do, I think, is, is related back to, to that grounding is growing up uh, mm-hmm. in, in mysticism. And one of the basic tenets of mysticism, regardless of what kind of mysticism, whether it's Jewish or Islamic or Christian um, or the variety of other traditions out there, that there is this understanding of this idea of oneness, of interconnectedness. And in mystical traditions, it's often referred to as like the oneness of God, you know, and it's given a much more, let's say, religious or spiritual description. Um, but I was always interested in how that idea and that basic philosophy, which underpins mysticism, um, can be expressed outside of religious and spiritual perspectives, especially at a time when the world has is and has been will is it becoming smaller and more um, people are realizing that there are connections in the way that they had been viewed as separate uh, in the past so that was that was kind of I guess the inspiration for the global oneness project was to start uh, a, a project that would explore that idea in a multiple multiple arenas kind different kinds of media different kinds of of sectors meaning how does this idea appear in environmental issues? How does it appear in social issues? How does it appear in political, economic, or in art, or in media, or in culture? Um, and so we started exploring those issues through film, and then through photography, and through the written word, and through multimedia. Um, mm-hmm. At the beginning, using a, a web platform to, uh, to explore that, and then as we grew, to broaden our platform to include also traditional media, television, theatrical, uh, released content and educational content, DVD, and of course the web where we started. Mm-hmm. And in fact, your your shorter films have been picked up on on uh, PBS and and uh, other networks. If I'm exactly, not. and but I but I think that where they've been viewed the most has been online, where they've been seen millions of times. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just because the web allows for people all over the world to, to tap into content that they're interested in. And what was really interesting to see is you know, we kind of rode the tide of interest in video on the web. When we started, there wasn't YouTube, there wasn't iTunes, there, all the platforms, no, no Netflix, uh, streaming, all the ubiquitous platforms we kind of take for granted, they weren't there eight years ago. Um, and so we kind of rode that wave of, of, of video on the web becoming um, you know, an alternative way to get content out there and uh, tapped into a global audience that were interested in these issues. They were really interested in both the spiritual ideas, but, uh, but also you know, what those, how those ideas then translated into what's going on in the world, both the good and the bad, how we can deal with the problems we're facing, how we can overcome the problems we're facing um, by acknowledging uh, that the problems are based on a dualistic mindset and how we can use you know, holistic thinking, systems thinking, um, building communities based around those ideas as a way forward. 
Uh, so it was fascinating to see kind of people becoming more and more interested in that uh, across across the world.